In this video, we're gonna look at how to find freedom from shame. You know, shame is a negative emotion that combines feelings of dishonor, unworthiness, embarrassment, and disgrace. See, shame is how we see ourselves and how we feel about ourselves because of the things we've done or because of the things that have happened to us. You know, I think a lot of times we get guilt and shame coupled together, but they are not the same thing. See, guilt is about what you've done. Shame is about who you are. Guilt is about the things we've done, right? We feel guilty when we lie, when we cheat on our diets, when we break a law or commit a sin. And when we experience guilt for a long period of time, it begins to define who we are. And when, when guilt kind of seeps into our emotional bloodstream, it permeates our sense of worth and dignity and becomes shame. See, guilt has to do with behavior. Shame has to do with identity. See, shame is so destructive because it strikes at the core of our identity. Shame takes one moment, one mistake, one decision, one failure, and uses it to define who you are. See, but God never intended for us to live with shame. God's design were, was for us to live unashamed. In, in Genesis 2.25, in a summary of the kind of life that God designed for us to have, it says that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. See, this is God's original plan. No shame, no feelings of unworthiness, humiliation, or disgrace. Nothing to hide, completely free and unashamed. But things didn't stay this way for very long. The very next verse, the serpent comes into the garden to tempt Eve to sin against God by eating from the forbidden tree. Adam and Eve both disobeyed God, and when they did, the scripture says that the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So the very first thing that happened when sin entered the world is that they became ashamed. When sin entered the world, shame came with it. And there are many different sources of shame in our lives, but the primary source of shame is sin. Right? Shame originally entered the world through sin, and it continues to enter our lives through sin. The sins done by us and the sins done to us. And so God created us to live unashamed, confident, connected, and free. But when shame came into the world, it started to communicate a different message to us. Genesis 3, 7 through 8 says this. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. See, Adam and Eve tried to cover their shame with fig leaves. But there's one problem with fig leaves. Caterpillars eat fig leaves, right? Now, we don't try to cover our shame with fig leaves, but our attempts to cover our shame are equally as futile as fig leaves, right? You can say that we have our own kind of modern fig leaves, right? We, we try to cover shame with our performance, right? And so shame says you're a failure, and so you try to prove the voice of shame wrong through your performance. These people become workaholics trying to climb the ladder of success in an effort to silence the voice of of shame that says you're a failure. You know, some of the most successful CEOs, athletes, entertainers, celebrities, and megachurch pastors are trying to overcome their own shame through performance. But no matter how hard you try, you'll never outperform shame. You'll never be successful enough, achieve enough, or accomplish enough to silence shame. No matter what you do, it'll never be enough. Number two, perfection. You know, some people try to remove shame by becoming perfectionists. They think that they, if they can just be flawless, then they won't feel shame. If they can just be the perfect spouse, the perfect parent, the perfect employee, and the perfect Christian, they can escape the weight of shame, which of course never works because perfection is impossible. Number three, projection. Some people project the shame they feel onto others, right? If they feel like a failure, they try to project that failure onto everyone else. If they are critical of themselves, they become critical of others. Uh, they feel shame for what they've done, so they try to find the dirt in other people's lives. If they feel rejected because of shame, they reject others, right? If they feel judged by God, they begin to judge others. The shame they feel internally is projected externally. And then number four, we pretend, right? We don't feel lovable, worthy, or accepted, so we, we pretend to be somebody that is lovable, worthy, and accepted. We put on a mask to cover our shame that keeps us from being authentic and vulnerable with others. You know, some people hide behind masks of, of arrogance and pride, being overly confident, while others hide behind low self-esteem, self-pity, 
And some hide, you know, behind masks of sarcasm, while others hide behind busyness and materialism. And these are all just masks that are nothing more than fig leaves that we use to try to cover our shame, right? These attempts to cover shame, right, through performance and perfection, projection and pretending, they're just about the same as trying to cover with fig leaves. They just don't work, right? They cannot remove or cover your shame because only the cross can do that. Hebrews 12, 1 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, through the cross, Jesus removed our shame. You know, when we hear the gospel, we typically hear how Jesus died for our sin to clear us from guilt and wrongdoing because we live in a culture where guilt and innocence are driving forces, right? We're afraid of breaking the law and getting caught, right? We don't want to be found guilty of wrong. We want to be innocent. And so the gospel that is presented focuses on guilt and innocence, right? You are guilty. Jesus died for your sins. Come to Jesus so you can be forgiven and receive innocence. But only 30% of the world lives in a guilt-innocence culture. 70% of the world lives in an honor-shame culture. Like if you go to Asia, you'll notice this immediately when you see people driving. Right? You'll see people swerving in and out of the lanes, driving through red lights, because the laws on the road, they're not really laws. They're just kind of more like guidelines. Their way of thinking is not like our way of thinking because they're not driven by guilt and innocence. The majority of the world has an honor-shame culture. And so the driving force of the majority of the world is shame and honor. People are afraid of being shamed and they desire honor. And if you've done something to bring shame on yourself or shame on your family, it's a lot harder to remove than guilt. See, if you're guilty, you pay the fine, you make restitution and everything is okay. But if you do something that brings shame upon yourself, it's not that easy. See, if someone suffered from shame, the only way to be free was for someone else to lift them up and restore them to a place of honor. And that is exactly what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. Jesus came to take our shame so that he could lift us up and restore us to a place of honor. This is what the cross is all about, removing shame and restoring honor. See, a naked man, Adam, related to a tree, brought shame into the world. And a naked man, Jesus, related to a tree, took shame out of the world. That's why Jesus is called the second Adam. See, the first Adam released shame into the world, but the second Adam removed shame from the world. Now, if Jesus carried our shame on the cross, then why are so many believers still struggling with shame? Why are so few people walking and living in the reality of the cross? It's because the voice of shame doesn't automatically stop talking to us when we become believers. See, one of the enemy's names is accuser in Revelation 12, 11, right? He is constantly reinforcing shame in our lives by whispering accusations. You didn't read your Bible today. You haven't prayed for a week. You weren't nice to your spouse this morning. You're a hypocrite. A real Christian wouldn't act that way. You've messed up too many times for God to forgive you. You don't deserve God's blessing. You're not good enough to come to church. You're not good enough to get that job. See, the enemy brings constant accusations to reinforce the message of shame. And you can't simply cancel out the voice of shame by ignoring it. No, you have to declare what God says about you. Your voice has to be louder than the voice of shame. You have to speak God's truth to every lie of the enemy. See, we sit around and allow the enemy to tell us who we are. We have to tell him who we are. We can't just let him tell us who we are. So when thoughts of shame start to fill your mind, interrupt that train of thought by declaring what God says about you, right? Say, I am a child of God. I am forgiven. I am accepted. I am loved. I am a new creation. I am chosen. I am blessed. I am favored. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, and I am more than a conqueror. Every time you declare what God says about you, you are overriding the message of shame and reinforcing the reality of your new identity. This is how we escape shame and find freedom. 
If you found this video helpful, do me a favor, smash that like button, share this video with a friend, and if you haven't already yet, subscribe to this channel. Just click on that bell so that you can be notified when new videos come out. Thanks for watching, and remember, if it's not good, God's not done.